Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this third of three amazing lectures that we've had today. Um, it's, it's my favorite day of the calendar, uh, of Purdue's research calendar, and um, it's particularly exciting to celebrate the best of the best and their contributions. So welcome here to, the, to this audience uh, to the Herbert Newby McCoy Award Lecture. Um, certainly one of, uh, one of the things I love to do. This, uh, uh, the McCoy Award was established in 1964 by Mrs. Ethel Terry McCoy to honor researchers in the natural sciences who have distinguished themselves among their colleagues. McCoy Award winners are nominated by their peers and selected by a faculty committee appointed by the president. This is the 52nd Distinguished McCoy Lecture. At this time, a fun, fun activity. Um, I'd like to recognize those of you in the audience who've uh, received a McCoy Award in the past. Could you stand, please, and be recognized? I see several of you. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage department head, newly minted department head, and, and biochemistry professor Chris Rusina. Uh, it is biochemistry, is it? Yeah. But it says biochemistry here. So, well, chemistry head. So I thought you were chemistry. She's the nominator of this year's award and will introduce this year's McCoy awardee, Professor Jean Shimlevsky, uh, the Alice Watson Kramer Distinguished Professor of Chemistry. Chris. Wow, what an honor to be here, um, and what a great day to celebrate uh, Jean's wonderful accomplishments. Um, so again, I'm Chris Rusin. I'm the newly minted department head of chemistry, and it's my real pleasure to introduce Jean today um, as this year's uh, McCoy Award winner. So just for a little background, Jean got her PhD at Columbia uh, University with Ron Breslow in 1988, and then was a postdoctoral fellow with Tom Kaiser at Rockefeller University, and then with Pete Schultz at uh, UC Berkeley. Jean began her faculty career here um, in the chemistry department back in 1990. And then as you can see from the slide here, she became the Alice Watson Kramer Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and is also a member of the School of um, Biomedical Engineering. So I'm, I'm aging myself a little bit, but I've known Jean for almost two decades. <laughs> um, it's hard to imagine, but it's, it's been an exciting time. And what has always really impressed me about Jean and her work is how she boldly um, approaches problems in science. Um, her, she was uh, a pioneer in disrupting protein-protein interactions. Um, when people thought they couldn't be done, Jean was bold enough to persevere, and now it's an exploding field. Um, and she should be congratulated for that. And that was work on HIV. And as you'll see, her work on HIV has come back um, again full circle in a slightly different way. And more uh, recently, and she'll tell you about today, is working on pathogenic bacteria, ba pathogenic bacteria that hide in human cells. And she's found a very clever way to um, help eradicate that. Jean is really fearless in her pursuit of new and highly significant challenges in research and solving problems in health and human disease. So um, her research excellence has been acknowledged with a number of awards, including the Arthur Cope Scholar Award and the Edward Leedy Award, both from the uh, American, Cancer so American, oops, <laughs> American Chemical Society and the Vincent Duvignard um, Award from the American Peptide Society. Um, impressively, Jean has worked with more than 60 graduate students and 60 undergraduate students in her career. She's graduated 33 PhDs and 17 master's students. I should add, on top of all of these accomplishments, Jean is also an award-winning teacher. And some of her students are here, I think, today, showing their support. There they are, they're in the back. Um, and she's also won the Murphy Award, which is the Purdue's large, highest honor for undergraduate teaching. So not only is she a, a phenomenal scholar, she's also an incredible teacher. Uh, so Jean's being recognized today for her fundamental studies in chemical biology and bionanotechnology and for the amazing impact that her uh, design systems are capable of, uh, from promoting brain delivery of different um, pharmaceuticals to developing 3D scaffolds for regenerative medicine. So please help me warmly welcome my colleague, collaborator, mentor, and friend, Jean Chmielewski.
Well, thank you very much, Suresh, uh, and thank you, Chris, for that very kind introduction. I'm incredibly honored to be the recipient of this year's Herbert Newby McCoy Award and to be here today to tell you a little bit about my science. Uh, in these sort of situations, you look back and you think about the mentors and the supporters that you've had over your career. And with that in mind, I'd like to dedicate today's seminar to my PhD mentor, Professor Ronald Breslow from Columbia University. He passed away last week uh, at, the age of uh, at the age of 86. So thank you, Ron, for everything that you did for my career. So today, what I would like to do is talk to you about some areas of research that are going on in my lab currently. Uh, we have three major areas that we're working on, but time won't allow me to really be able to speak about all three of these, so I'm sorry for the graduate students in my group because I will be leaving that one out today and <laughs> focusing on these two, which are more um, linked with the uh, idea of trying to come up with new ways to target uh, uh, agents of infectious disease. So I'll start by talking about some of our work in HIV and trying to eradicate HIV reservoirs that exist within the body. Uh, HIV is a, still a terrible problem. These are some data from 2014 indicating the number of people that are living with HIV in, some, in different uh, places around the globe. Uh, new HIV infections, there were 2 million of them in 2014, and over a million uh, AIDS-related deaths in 2014. So it's still a huge, significant problem that we're dealing with uh, on the globe. Uh, at this point in time, with sub-Saharan Africa still bearing most of that burden, 60 to 70 percent of those statistics are from that area alone. So there's still a huge need to be able to develop and work in this area. Uh, for instance, we're trying to come up with new therapies in this area. Highly active antiretroviral therapy, or HART, has to date brought plasma levels of HIV in many, many people to undetectable levels. But we still are just treating HIV, as great as those advancements are and with a bit our ability to control people's infection, we're still treating HIV and not curing HIV. And that is really uh, the latest large challenge in HIV research. Uh, there's not a cure for HIV because, in part, because HIV hides in our bodies in different reservoirs. Uh, there are spots in the body where HIV is hiding, which and, and does some low levels of production of active virus. But there are also other reservoirs of HIV in the body, which are latent reservoirs, where the uh, proviral DNA of the virus has an inserted itself in, inside of the human chromosome. And various events within the body can lead to that latent uh, DNA being turned into active forms of the virus. And uh, you know, so if you take someone off, highly active antiretroviral therapy, uh, the virus comes back because of these reservoirs. So this is an area where we're really going to need to come up with some very new strategies to try and eradicate these reservoirs. Some of the spots where the reservoirs are, there are a variety of cellular and anatomical spots of HIV reservoirs in the body. And I've just indicated uh, macrophages and lymphocytes as two cellular examples. Uh, the the blood-brain barrier and the blood-testes barrier protecting the CNS and the testes, respectively, are two anatomical sites. Uh, we still don't really have a very good handle on where all the reservoirs are. And there's a lot of research being done in this area as well. But I chose these four examples because very very interestingly, each one of those reservoir sites are protected by efflux transporter proteins. And I'll try and give you a feeling about what that means with respect to the blood-brain barrier, for instance. So peak glycoprotein, this is a protein that's in one of these efflux transporters that's found at the blood-brain barrier. And I'm giving you a little picture, a little schematic of a brain capillary. Looking down the middle of the brain capillary, it's surrounded by endothelial cells and then brain tissue, brain cells after that. If you zoom in on the cells lining the blood vessel here, there are these endothelial cells that line the blood vessel. And that is where the efflux transporter proteins, like P-glycoprotein or PGP, exist. They're on the apical side of the luminal membrane of these brain capillary endothelial cells. And so if you are trying to get a small molecule therapy into the brain, a 
through the blood-brain barrier, it's inhibited because of P. glycoproteins. But at the same time, the virus is able to get across this blood-brain barrier through a number of biological uh, means uh, within human cells, which are brought normally into the brain. So the virus can get into the brain, but our small molecule therapies are not able to because of these efflux protein transporters. So for instance, the uh, peak glycoprotein is expressed at, at fairly high levels at that blood-brain barrier in the endothelial cells, and it acts. Here's a, a crystal structure that's come out of two groups, peak glycoprotein, which is embedded in the membrane of those endothelial cells. And if you're trying to get a molecule that is uh, in the, the blood, into the brain, uh, into those endothelial cells, it could, the molecule will go in, the drug will go into the membrane, there's a portal within the transporter protein, and there are binding sites within the, uh, the efflux protein. ATP binds and gets hydrolyzes. That allows a conformational change, which effluxes that drug out of the protein, the transporter protein. So you're trying to get a therapy inside of those cells, and this protein is here sending it right back out. So it's very difficult to accumulate any significant level of drugs, which are substrates of peak glycoprotein and other transporters of this sort, if it's expressed at that site. And I've just given you an example, and it's a very specific HIV example. I could fill this slide with very small font of all the different therapies that are substrates of these types of efflux transporters. But, and I've only chosen a few of the antiviral, the anti-HIV compounds to show you a few select examples of HIV, anti-HIV agents, which target the protease enzyme of HIV, uh, reverse transcriptase, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, even the most recent entry inhibitors, these are all anti-HIV drugs, are all substrates and are effluxed in this way. So it's very difficult to accumulate and to send some of these therapies into the brain. And that is, some, at some level, what helps these HIV reservoirs to be able to form. So what we would like to be able to do then, if PGP is here at the endothelial cells, we'd like to be able to inhibit P glycoprotein so that the small molecule therapies can enter into the brain. And so that's a part of what I'll tell you about today. Uh, so here's just a small cartoon of that larger crystal structure that I was showing you. Uh, H, uh, this is peak glycoprotein bound in the membrane. From a number of biophysical and crystallographic studies, we know that there are at least two binding sites in that transmembrane area that the substrates or drugs that are trying to get into the cell bind to on their way to being effluxed back out of the cell. So our initial idea was that what if we then take one of those substrates that would normally be effluxed, if we dimerize them into a single entity, they should be able to bind to P-glycoprotein more tightly as a dimer, have a, a, a much lower off rate from P-glycoprotein and act as inhibitors in that way. So we could inhibit P-glycoprotein by dimerizing the substrate in that way. So we've used a number of different strategies. I'm only going to focus on one very specific area today to tell you a little bit about what we've done. We de developed a traceless tether strategy. So these dimers that we wanted to create, whether they were drugs or different substrates of peak glycoprotein, we devised a way to tether them into these dimers so that in a reducing environment of a cell, if this entered the cell, this dimeric agent could release the drug away from the tether, and so that's why we're calling it traceless, the, the tether breaks down and completely regenerates the monomeric drug. So we're calling it a Trojan horse strategy because by dimerizing this compound, it can inhibit peak glycoprotein, but also once it enters the cell in hiding as the dimer, it can then release and generate the active agent. So that was the plan for what we wanted to try and do. The very first molecule we tried this with was a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. That's an enzyme of HIV, abacavir. It inhibits reverse transcriptase, but it's also a peak glycoprotein substrate. It's one of those molecules that's effluxed. Uh, there have been some very nice experiments that have been done with knockout mice where peak glycoprotein was taken down um, from these mice. And you could see about a 20-fold greater accumulation of abacavir in the brain of those mice once, once peak glycoprotein was not there. So without peak glycoprotein, this molecule will go into the brain just fine. With it, it effluxes, it keeps it in those brain capillaries. So using our strategy then, 
to link two of these units together with a traceless tether so that we could start with a molecule that's a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, a peak glycoprotein substrate. By dimerizing it, we could turn it into a peak glycoprotein inhibitor. And as a peak glycoprotein inhibitor, it would block PGP, so it can't efflux any of the, its, this molecule or its substrate. And if this molecule goes into cells, it could revert then back to the dimer in the reducing environment of the cell. The dimer can revert back to the monomer and inhibit HIV reverse transcriptase. So that was our plan. Here's a little bit of the data. First off, can we inhibit P glycoprotein with these dimeric agents? We have a very nice cellular assay to be able to do that. We have cells that have overexpression of P glycoprotein or endogenous high expression of P glycoprotein in their membranes. If we treat them with a fluorescent substrate, a molecule which is usually efflux, this fluorescence does not accumulate in those cells. But if we treat those cells with an inhibitor, and that fluorescent substrate. If we inhibit the peak glycoprotein, then the fluorescent molecule can enter and stay there and we can see fluorescence. So we can use confocal microscopy to visualize this, flow cytometry to quantitate this. And we've done it in two different kinds of cells, uh, the human brain capillary cells that we can culture, and also some T cells, which would normally could be infected by HIV. If we take the monomeric abacavir itself, up to 500, 200 micromolar in those cell lines, we see no inhibition of peak glycoprotein, but simply by dimerizing them with these simple tethers, we start to see potent inhibition of peak glycoprotein. We put, in this position, these X and Y could either both be hydrogens or one or two methyl groups. And we put those in there because we were worried about cellular esterases. Esterases will cleave ester linkages, and these were fairly exposed esters within these dimers. We wanted to have more long-term plasma stability of these molecules, and we thought by putting methyl groups here, we could block that carbonyl from the esterases action. So uh, with the methyls, we even see in some cases submicromolar inhibition. In this case, with the two methyls at each position, we see submicromolar inhibition. In terms of uh, the plasma stability, we're, we were completely right. With no methyls in this position, the half-life, the plasma stability for that compound with just hydrogen there is just a couple hours. And, a half, and in 1.6 hours, uh, half of that molecule has broken down to give you back a bacavir. Uh, we don't want that. We want this material to be able to withstand uh, esterases so that it can get to through the brain capillaries and have its action at those endothelial cells. Putting one methyl in each position, we increased it by a few hours. Putting two methyls at each of these positions, now up to 100 uh, hours, we're still not at 50% cleavage of this molecule back to monomeric abacavir. Also in reducing environments, that's what we want to have happen, right? Once this goes into the endothelial cells, we want the reducing environment of the cytosol to re have this molecule be able to revert back to monomer. And you can see the half-lives uh, that we can report here with DTT, which is just a, a simple reducing agent uh, without the methyls, so on the order of about nine-hour half-life in the reducing environment. That about doubles when we put the methyl groups there because we are blocking the disulfide still somewhat, but still well within the range of the kinds of numbers that we would need for these experiments. So these dimeric prodrugs can both inhibit peak glycoprotein and also then revert to monomeric drug in a reducing environment while maintaining stability in just plasma um, that, that, one would, that they would see within the, within the body. We've looked also at a, a model of the blood-brain barrier. This is just a rat endothelial cells that were taken from the blood-brain barrier. And you can load those capillaries up with a fluorescent molecule in the inside. Peak glycoprotein is there in those endothelial cells, keeping that molecule, if we load it up with a PGP substrate, keeping it in the blood, not allowing it get, to get out into the extraneous tissue. And so if we can inhibit peak glycoprotein, those fluorescent substrates should be able to leak out into the surrounding media. And that's what we observe. We can see loss of the accumulation of a fluorescent version of a bacavir from these inside of these capillaries as we add increasing amounts of the dimers. And here are just some images of those capillaries. Here's what they look like with control buffer, very nice bright green fluorescence. And then with the inhibitors, you can see that fluorescence has diminished as that substrate has, has leaked out from within those capillaries. So another indication that we're inhibiting peak glycoprotein, in this case, in an actual capillary from the brain. 
Finally, we also wanted to make sure that these compounds can break down in cells and have anti-HIV activity. So if we had our dimers and they were able to get into the reducing environment, once within a cell, they should be able to regenerate the monomeric abacavir, which is the reverse transcriptase inhibitor, which should then be able to go and inhibit HIV reverse transcriptase. And if that happens, then we should see a, a decrease in the production of HIV within infected cells. And we use two different T cells in this case, 12D7 and the MT2T2. Uh, in the 12D7s, we were looking at the production of a P24 protein. That's a uh, HIV protein, so you can use that to monitor how much HIV is in existence. Or we can look at cell viability because HIV causes cell death in this T cell line. And you can see here's a Bacavir, the monomeric drug. If we treat these cells with a Bacavir in a concentration dependent manner, we can knock down the levels of HIV. And with our dimers, we can do exactly the same thing. These compounds as dimers are not reverse transcriptase inhibitors, so this is the proof that these compounds when they're in the cell, are reverting back to the monomeric drug. And that happens in both of the P24 assay and also the cell viability assay. We see an increase in cell viability as a Bacavir is added because there's less HIV to kill those cells. And we see the same thing with our dimeric agents as well. So this gave us our first indication that within cells, these compounds can break down and have anti-HIV activity. And that was really significant and, and exciting. Since then, we've been very interested in trying to take this to the next step, which is to try and use combinations of antivirals. It's the way in which uh, heart HIV treatment is usually administered. It's usually combinations of therapies so that you don't end up getting the resistance that you'll see with many of the single therapies. And so in our dimeric strategy, we made a heterodimer that was consistent of a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, a bacavir, and an HIV protease inhibitor, nelfinivir, covalently linked using one of those traceless tethers. These compounds are particularly good inhibitors of P glycoprotein, submicromolar inhibition in both the T cell line and the endothelial cells from human blood brain barrier. And uh, we've also looked in uh, T cells at HIV levels then. We've treated those T cells with these dimeric agents and looked at the P24 levels, the indication of HIV in those cells. Here's just a control. There are a couple blanks here because this is so large, you wouldn't be able to see some of these small bars if I didn't break these off. Abacavir is a moderate uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitor in, against HIV in cells. Uh, nelfinivir, the protease inhibitor, is a much more potent agent. So you can see we've gone from about over 2,000 down to below 100 at 70 nanomolar. And really exciting to us, these dimeric, heterodimeric agents also are knocking these levels down to incredibly low levels at low nanomolar types of concentrations. And this is significant because nelfinivir, if you treated the uh, humans with nelfinivir and wanted those to get into the brain, these will not enter the brain because of P-glycoprotein. Uh, this compound should have a very good ability to enter the brain, and we're starting those experiments right now. These experiments that I've been showing you target HIV that could be in reservoirs where there's active HIV production. The really tough one is the latent infection, right? There's no HIV being produced. The DNA is embedded within the uh, human chromosomes, right? And so we've started a recent project where we're trying uh, to um, co-opt this shock and kill approach that's been coming out to eradicate HIV reservoirs. This shock and kill approach uh, in, takes latent infected, HIV infected cells, and treats them with a variety of small molecules that turns on the HIV from the latent uh, cells, the latent HIV. And once you start produ producing active HIV, very often that will kill those cells, or you can come in with a secondary antibody which can target and kill those cells as well. But while you're doing that, HIV is budding off of those cells and escaping. And so you need to have the highly active antiretroviral therapy there to be able to kill any of those escaping viruses. And if you're at the blood in the brain, you're not going to have the heart there because most of the substrates, most of the antivirals, as I've shown you, are substrates of P-glycoprotein, and they're not going to be able to get in. So we've been trying to link some of these Pro, uh, these anti-latency compounds like prostratin with antiviral agents 
in this heterodimer type of a form to be able to turn on the latent HIV, but then right there, since they're covalently linked, you'll have the antiviral agent to be able to, in places like the brain, to be able to go in and uh, kill those viruses. So this is a, a new area of research in our group, but it, it's starting to look really quite promising at this point. Uh, so that's what I'd like to tell you about some of our anti-HIV work. Uh, we've used P glycoprotein, especially at the blood brain barrier, to target a number of other um, very uh, significant diseases, for instance, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, schizophrenia. These are all cases where you need to be able to get therapies into the brain, and a lot of the compounds that are used to treat these diseases are substrates of these efflux transporters. Similarly, uh, in malaria, there is another transporter, the P-falsoparum chloroquine resistance transporter, which also causes resistance, and we've had good um, uh, outcomes using this platform technology in all of these other areas as well. So that's what I can tell you today in, in a short little snippet about our work towards eradicating HIV reservoirs overall. I wanted to switch gears then into another infectious disease target, namely trying to target intracellular pathogenic bacteria uh, with some molecules that we've developed. Bacterial, bacteria cause many different types of uh, infections, uh, listing many types of infections caused by many different kinds of bacteria. Um, some of the big, uh, bad bacteria infections, tuberculosis, it ranks alongside HIV as one of the leading causes of death. Here's some more 2014 data. 1.5 million people died of tuberculosis in 2014. And interestingly, there's a link. People who have HIV, whose immune systems are compromised, are even more likely to die of tuberculosis as well. And that's caused by uh, bacteria, mycobacteria tuberculosis. Uh, Staph aureus contributes to a number of different disease states. And methicillin resistance, uh, Staph aureus, is a significant problem in hospital-acquired uh, um, infections, um, especially uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia, for instance. And while there are all of these uh, very dire um, and drug-resistant bacteria which are out there and are being produced, the ability to target them, kill them, has really been diminished. Uh, this is a, a, just a graph showing the increase, for instance, in methicillin-resistant Staph aureus drug-resistant Staph aureus, and a few other um, bacteria that are resistant as well. So, you know, from 1980 above to 2000, there was a great increase in the incident of antibiotic resistance with MRSA. At the same time, on the blue graph here, we're looking at the number of antibiotics approved. This has dropped precipitously. And um, some years, there's just a couple. Um, the last few years, just a few new antibiotics were approved. So as we have this great need for new antibiotics, the production of new therapies has really not kept up to date. And so uh, for this reason, in terms of uh, drug-resistant bacteria and other reasons, we're really very interested in trying to develop new agents in this way. We also are particularly interested in bacteria which hide out within human cells. For instance, mycobacteria tuberculosis becomes incredibly difficult to treat once it goes inside of macrophages, for instance, human macrophages. So macrophages, their job is to engulf these bacteria, and they do, but then these bacteria have figured out how to co-opt the whole life cycle of those macrophages to survive within the macrophages. And they go on, and they reproduce, and they lyse that cell and can go on and infect other cells. They're really hard to treat because the small molecule therapies that we have developed were developed to target the individual bacteria, not the bacteria that are living inside of these cells, right? So the aminoglycosides, uh, beta-lactams, the glycopeptides like vancomycin don't penetrate mammalian cell membranes very effectively at all. So the bacteria are free to roam and they hide out in a variety of different places within the human cells. So what we wanted to be able to do then was to develop molecules that could penetrate that mammalian cell membrane and target these bacteria no matter where they are hiding in the cell. To do that, uh, we've spent a 
a number of years trying to develop molecules that could effectively penetrate cells. Um, we've, there are whole classes of cell penetrating peptides. Usually they're highly cationic. They don't have to have a normal amid backbone. And they can enter cells, they can penetrate cells by a number of different mechanisms. At the same time, there are a series of antimicrobial peptides. They're naturally occurring. They're in humans, plants, all sorts of places. Antimicrobial peptides, which are also cationic. Very often, they're amphiphilic. They have a polar side and a nonpolar side. Very often, they're alpha helical. And uh, they act as antimicrobials by lysing the bacterial membrane which is great for killing the bacteria, but not so great for human cells. So most antimicrobial peptides can't really be used as therapies because they lyse human cells as well, like red blood cells. We wanted to be able to combine the best features of cell penetrating peptides and antimicrobial peptides to come up with agents that could enter the mammalian cells and kill those bacteria hiding out within it. And to do so, we generated this series of molecules called cationic amphiphilic polyproline helices. There's a series of proline amino acids linked together, and we did that so that we could have a rigid scaffold of a polyproline type 2 helix, where there's a, a proline residue every third amino acid in this little helix. And then we did chemical modification on these amino acids to put in cationic moieties in blue on one face of the molecule, and hydrophobic groups, in this case isobutyl groups, on another side of the molecules. Um, so um, we have also made different lengths of these sequences. There's repeating units of three, four, and five that we've prepared. And we've done a lot of different experiments with these compounds over the years. It's going to generalize really quickly a lot of data and then show you some specific data. So it turns out that these compounds that we de developed are able to penetrate mammalian cells very effectively. And depending on what the hydrophobic group is on this face, they go to different places within the cell. They're broad spectrum antibiotics. They have minimal toxicity to human cells. They, don't, they aren't easily cleaved up into little pieces by human proteases. And importantly, they do not lyse mem uh, membranes. Um, and we've identified protein targets within the bacteria that they have an activity against. So I'm going to just jump from all of that now to how do these compounds, how effective are they against bacteria that are hiding out in cells? And we chose two bacteria initially, Salmonella and Brucella. So we can take macrophages, human macrophages, infect them with Salmonella or Brucella, and then come in with treatment of our compounds that I showed you on the last slide. In this case, this is P14, the four repeating unit, and the five repeating unit, P17. Uh, we incubate them, certain concentration of the peptides, let it go for a certain period of time. Then we can evaluate those cells and see how much bacteria grows. Here's just a control with no agents added. In green are the P14 compounds. In pink are the P17 compounds. So in both the Salmonella and the Brucella case, we could reduce either down to 60% bacteria levels or 80% bacteria levels within those cells. That was the first indication that we had that we would be able to make this work. But 80% of the 20% of the bacteria are still in there and doing just fine. And so you leave them go, and they're going to just keep on going. So we needed to bring these down to lower levels. And we come up with two different strategies to make, try and um, get to more effective intracellular clearance of the bacteria. The first thing that we did uh, was to try and change this hydrophobic group. We needed this cationic moiety in this blue region, but this region we've found that we could make a lot of changes to. But we wanted to make a lot of changes quickly. And if we just kept this ether functionality here, we would have to make a new amino acid every time we wanted to make a new peptide with a new hydrophobic group. So we came up with a new strategy where we would use um, an amid group that we could then append a hydrophobic group off of. Um, and then we could do this on the resin, a solid phase that we do the peptide synthesis on, and on resin make a variety of different compounds. And we did this with two different lengths, n equals 3 and n equals 4. Here are some of the R, different R groups that we made. So here are two different peptide lengths and nine different hydrophobic groups in this position. So we would make one molecule with either the C5 in all of the R positions, or another molecule with this cyclic molecule in all of these positions with the two different lengths. So in all, we made 18 different compounds. And we could test to see whether or not they could penetrate mammalian cells. So here we just take 
Um, in this case, we took J774A1 macrophages, treated them with our compounds that have a fluorescent tag on them, and then looked at the fluorescence of those molecules using confocal microscopy and flow cytometry to quantitate. And here's our starting structure where this was the isobutyl modified compound I showed you on the previous slide. And here are all the different library compounds we made. And you can see a large number of those library compounds penetrate mammalian cells much more effectively than that starting isobutyl group. Uh, we also looked at the cytotoxicity of all of these compounds. And from those two cross cross-referencing cell penetration with low cytotoxicity, we chose three compounds to move on forward with. All of them have a five carbon unit, but they're either linear or branched or cyclic in this position in the R spot for these. We also use confocal microscopy to see where these compounds went within the cell. What was their subcellular localization? And, sorry, uh, in the case of 5L and 5B, both of those were mostly localized in the cytosol of those macrophages. Interesting, though. If you go and you change a, uh, a five-carbon unit, put it in a ring, the cyclopentyl ring, and suddenly we're in endosomes. So depending on what kind of five-carbon unit we have on there, we can go to different places in the cell, which is great because there are bacteria that reside in cytosomes, and there are bacteria that reside in endosomes. So we had a potential way to not just get into the cell, but try and target those bacteria. So here are three bacteria then. Here are two of the cytosol residing bacteria, Shigella and Listeria. And we tested all three of those peptides against the cytosol residing. Here's 5L. That was one of the cytosol residing peptides. We completely can eradicate Shigella and Listeria now from those macrophages. In the case of Salmonella, Salmonella stays in endosomes and can survive quite well within endosomes of um, macrophages. And in that particular case, the peptide that is the best against that endosomally residing bacteria is the 5-cyclic compound, 5C, which resides in endosomes. And so we've done some confocal microscopy experiments where we've looked at this co-localization. And indeed, 5L co-localizes with Shigella inside the mammalian cells, and 5C co-localizes with the Salmonella. So we, can get, we truly can get in and localize and kill these cells specifically. Another way that we tried to bolster up that activity that we saw from our initial series of compounds, where we still had anywhere from 20 to 40 percent bacteria still residing in the cell, was to make some dual antibiotic conjugates. Taking an antibiotic, a small molecule antibiotic like canamycin, and linking it up to our cell penetrating non-lytic antibiotics that we developed using that same tether that I showed you in the first project, right? So that this has the ability to release, once it goes into the cytosol, release the canamycin to be off and do what it needs to do as an antibiotic, and release our peptide that we designed that it can go off and do what it needs to do as an antibiotic. And this is particularly important because canamycin on its own, sorry, canamycin on its own does not cross mammalian cell membranes very effectively at all. Uh, we also made compounds that do not have this disulfide, so they couldn't have this reducible um, regeneration of the two therapies. Since it's two antibiotics, they're covalently linked together but can be released, we thought that since this is a dual antibiotic, that we might see lower amounts of drug resistance when we have these two connected to one another. And here is some experiments looking at the change in the MIC, which is the minimum inhibitory concentration for our compounds. It's the activity change. So as uh, the number of passages, so we exposed Staph aureus to eight passages of sub-inhibitory concentrations of either just the peptide or the canamycin or the peptide linked to the canamycin or a couple of other control antibiotics. And with canamycin, so let's just focus on the red, after six or seven passages, the MIC starts to rise so that you need much, much more compound to be able to kill those bacteria. So it, that's drug resistance accumulating at that point. The peptide itself is in green. It's not too bad. But still, the MIC is increased by about 20-fold after eight passages. Whereas when we've linked the two compounds together, that's in the dark blue, we see very small changes 
in the activity of these compounds when they're covalently linked and have the ability to release. So bringing them both together and bringing them both together as a conjugate can really work to try and limit the amount of drug resistance one sees. We've also looked at this dual conjugate uh, in macrophages infected with the salmonella and the brucella. Here is the peptide alone. Here's canamycin alone. And here's a one-to-one -one mixture of the peptide and the canamycin, not covalently linked together. You can see this is only about additive, the activity that one sees. Here we're looking at the amount of bacteria that are still remaining in those macrophages. So there's still quite a lot of bacteria. Uh, we go and we use this dual conjugate. In the case of salmonella, we've dropped this down now to 95%. So significantly increase the activity against these intracellular pathogenic bacteria. Uh, when we don't have that disulfide, can C is two methylene units there. Uh, it's not that different from the one-to-one -one mix. So it's really quite important to have that disulfide so that in the reducing environment of the cell, those two antibiotics can separate and go and do their own thing. We've also looked at um, mycobacteria. Smegmatis, which is just a faster growing version of mycobacteria, and mycobacteria tuberculosis, the causative agent of TB. And there's some concentration dependence here, but here's the peptide alone, here's canamycin alone, and here's the one-to-one -one mixture of the peptide and the canamycin. And here is the dual conjugate, a 10 micromolar. We're also down to 95% reduction in the bacteria levels, for instance, of the mycobacteria smegmatis and the mycobacteria tuberculosis. So very effective killing, in this case, using this dual conjugate. So what are we doing with these compounds? Well, in the case of just the peptides alone, without another antibiotic attached, we've been looking to, uh, as a therapy for treatment of complicated skin and soft tissue infections, because we have molecules that can penetrate cells, kill bacteria, kill bacteria in culture. Um, and we're, you know, specifically, if one looks at diabetic foot ulcers, there's more, to, more than 80,000 amputations a year due to diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, half of those people will end up having infections and having to, in the other limb within 18 months. And also the three-year mortality for people after their first imp amputation is really quite high. So we'd really like to be able to come at this disease. And we think that our uh, cationic polyproline helices are particularly suited to this. So we've been able to demonstrate um, activity against all clinical isolates of Staph aureus. And that's usually the prime bacteria, in addition to a number of other bacteria that then cohabitate there. Um, uh, Staph aureus is in wounds. But we also have that broad spectrum that you need in that case. We've been able to show that we can clear established biofilms of Staph aureus, and that's important because there are biofilms that also form within these chronic wounds like diabetic foot ulcers as well. We've done some um, in mice uh, wound models um, with MRSA infected wounds, and we've been able to show significant wound closure uh, and reduced bacterial load within those wounds. And also we can reduce the inflammatory cytokines, which make it very difficult to treat some of these wounds as well. So all of these have come together um, and uh, we've, we're working closely with the company and have funding from NIH to try and use these compounds uh, in this setting. In terms of the dual conjugates, the canamycin, for instance, and the peptide dual co antibiotic conjugates, we're going after hospital-acquired pneumonia in that case. Uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia, there are a number of cases per hospital admissions. Uh, it increases the hospital stay, having hospital-acquired pneumonia quite significantly. And because many of the people that are in hospitals to begin with who then get this hospital-acquired pneumonia, there is a very high mortality rate. And we think some of the features associated with our antibiotic peptide conjugates should really be very effective against those because we've uh, enhanced the activity of the antibiotics by getting cell penetration, and we're going to have to penetrate the lung tissue to be able to get at some of these bacteria. We're also highly potent against a number of clinical isolates uh, that are a part of the hospital-acquired pneumonia. Um, there should be less resistance, as I showed you. And we can clear established biofilms of a number of uh, staph 
bacteria, and that's very important because a lot of the uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia is on the ventilator tubes, and they are uh, Staphylococcus bacteria um, biofilms that usually happen in that case. And as I said, also the pro reducing those levels of those pro-inflammatory cytokines should really give us better outcomes for critically ill patients. So. Uh, chronic wounds, hospital-acquired pneumonia, those are our two main uh, targets that we're going after with these agents. So there's a, that's just a little bit of an idea of what we've been doing to target these intracellular pathogenic bacteria with this novel class of peptides that can go into mammalian cells and target those bacteria where they're hiding out. So I've been able to show you two of our infectious disease projects today. Hopefully someday in the future I can come back and tell you a little bit about the biomaterials that we're making for regenerative medicine, but uh, that's been the focus of today's talk. Uh, started here in 1990, so 27 years of working with incredible graduate students. This is just a list of all of the students who have gotten PhDs in my group. I believe there's 33 of them in the various places that they've gone to. We've had an incredibly fun journey along the way. <clears throat> Tearing up, <laughs> looking at this list. Starting with Pat Bishop. Pat, I think I saw you, you're in the audience. Pat Bishop and Ray Lutgring, my very first two PhDs, uh, my two most recent PhDs, a lot of the second talk that I showed you about uh, is the work of Anna Bresden and Manish Nepal, who are both off in the world as well at Dow and Intel. Uh, I can't thank them enough. Uh, also the 17 uh, master's level scientists that I've worked with uh, over 60 undergraduates have been a part of the program as well. So it's just a, been an incredible experience. Uh, these are the students who have more recently worked on the projects that I described today. Uh, our biomaterials work, our cell penetrating antibiotics and the drug resistance transporters. And I've highlighted the students that are currently in my group. Monesha Vallab and Ryan are working on the biomaterials. Rena, Samantha, Jenny and Neha are working on the cell penetrating antibiotics project and Neha, Jennifer, and Moises most recently on that uh, anti-latency project uh, are working in the drug-resistant transporter areas. Um, and uh, these are the current undergraduates, Megan, Colin, and Delaney, who are working in my lab right now. Also, I'm incredibly indebted to two of my collaborators and their research groups. Uh, Professor Mohammed Salim, who's in comparative pathobiology here in Purdue, is a jewel, and many of us collaborate with him. Uh, I can't thank him enough for all of his help in uh, the pathogenic bacteria work and guiding us through a lot of those experiments and doing many of those experiments with his lab. Also, I've been a long-term collaborator with Chris Racina, who uh, introduced me. Uh, she is a world's expert in drug resistance transporters. And when she arrived at Purdue, I thought, we can do something, and we have. And so it's been, it's been very, very fun. And uh, as a number of the students who, uh, uh, undergraduates who are in the audience, uh, they've had both Chris and I back to back for teaching. And so uh, that's been a fun uh, effort as well. Uh, NSF has been an incredible uh, funder of our research over the years. They have funded both our biomaterials and our cell penetrating work. The National Institutes of Health is now starting to fund some of our um, clinical applications and also has funded our drug resistance transporters work. Uh, Melinda, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant has supported our malaria research and recently the Trask Foundation at Purdue is supporting some of our clinical experiments with the cell penetrating peptides. So I thank all of them very much. And I'd like to just finish by thanking, <clears throat> there I go again, tearing up again, <clears throat> uh, my, my dear friend and husband and colleague in the chemistry department, Mark Lipton, and also my son, Andy. And uh, without them, all of this would have been a lot less fun. So <laughs> I better stop there. Thank you very much. Get me back to science, so I'll stop crying. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean. We have time for questions. If you could raise your hand, please. I'm happy to have any questions. It's a bit of an odd room for that, but feel free if you feel compelled. Speak loudly. We'll bring a mic to you or Dean can... 
Any undergrads? Any Chem 256 students? Yay. Keep your hand up. You got a question? All of you got questions? <laughs> Feel free to ask a question. So clear. There we go. Marietta, thank you. Yeah, so you can do, sure, the question was, um, what are our models for some of this clinical work, right? And so what do we, what can we do? So for the, the chronic wounds, um, uh, Mohamed Salim has wound models in mice. So you can infect uh, wounds in mice with Staph aureus and other bacteria. And then you can let that grow. You can monitor the size of the wound with time. You can scrape out the bacteria. I'm glad he does those. And, and monitor levels of bacteria. So we, the wound model is quite good. And actually, you know, the pneumonia model is amazing. Um, you, can, um, you can get bacteria into the lungs of, of the animals. And then you just drop your agent, basically, or in the nose area, and they aspirate it into the lungs. And you can, you can do it that way as well. And you know, there's obviously more that has to go on then to get those s tissues uh, from the animals to be able to see the bacteria levels. But both of those are, are well-established um, uh, in vivo models for wound and lung infection. So that means the infection would be um, on the diabetic um, foot ulcer? Yeah, for, um, the, for the uh, diabetic foot ulcer or any kind of wound, you can do a topical application, which when you don't have to go systemic, that, that, is, that could be preferable. So you notice that we've got, we've worked We've got a lot of data, and we had to choose which one to go after, right? So uh, the wound is a topical, a little bit easier of a cell to NIH for STTRs and SBIRs. And the lung model is you know, not necessarily systemic as well, because it's an aspirated model. So we chose those two purposefully. But it doesn't mean that we can't do other things. It's just more of a cell. How, how easy is it to sell one over the other, unfortunately? Uh, we are very, very interested in doing the microbacteria tuberculosis as well. Uh, instead, also in, in addition to hospital-acquired pneumonia, cystic fibrosis has some of these very similar lung-related um, incidents of bacteria infections. So we're quite interested in that. So there's a lot of places we can go. and. You know, so we're just trying to control ourselves a little bit into a few channels. But yeah, <laughs> hard. <laughs> Very good questions, though. Yes, go ahead. Please ask uh, Dudley yeah. if you can. Matt, yes. Yeah, so your the clearance of bacteria within the cell, I mean, with that. That five linear. Could you repeat the question? Yes, uh, the uh, clearance of the bacteria within cells. He was commenting on, and you know, with that five linear peptide completely eradicating Shigella and Listeria, when Mohammed first got that data, he said, "Gene, this is too good to be true." And then he repeated it and repeated it, and it is true. But it is really, really um, incredible that we can do that. So yes. So then, and then your what's your question then? So Um, so we know gram-positive bacteria. We don't know gram-negative bacteria yet. Gram-positive bacteria, there's a particular enzyme. It could be target or targets, right? So we've identified one protein target uh, in gram-positive bacteria. It's the enolase enzyme of, of gram-positive bacteria, which is an essential enzyme in glycolysis. And you would think, well, how is that going to be selective? Because humans also have enolase and do glycolysis. But the Staph aureus, for instance, enolase, the crystal structure was solved, and there are biophysical studies. It's an octamer. The human is a dimer, and we don't have any activity against that dimer at all. Uh, Gram-negative bacteria, we do the same experiments with E. coli enolase. It's also a dimer. We don't have any activity against gram-negative enolase. So, so I, I know what this one target in gram-positive bacteria. Are there other targets? We're still working to find that out. And gram negative is a, an area that we're starting to push now to find out what, what we're targeting in those cases. 
back of the room. That's a wonderful question. I think everyone heard it. Do you would like me to repeat? I will repeat it for the, the mic. Yes. Uh, the question was um, um, the compounds that the peptides that we find localized uh, in the cytosol, did they go in through endocytosis and then get released from the endosome? Right? Perfectly reasonable question. Um, we're doing a number of endocytosis inhibition experiments we have planned, but we did some experiments where we looked at really short time periods, treated the cells in really short time periods where you, if you went through endocytosis, you would not have had time to get released into the cytosol. Still, you can find these peptides throughout the cell. So I think they're going through a direct translocation um, through the membrane and not through endocytosis. So there really are two, just making that very small change with five carbons, cyclic versus linear or branch, you go through the cell in two different ways. Uh, we've got some um, uh, lipid binding um, experiments planned to try and see if that has to do with binding affinities and if that correlates to translocation uh, rates. Uh, so we've, we still have to pin down exactly why that is. But it is really true. One is going through, the two molecules are going through different mechanisms of entry into the mammalian cells. So one last question. Otherwise, well, um, thank you, Jean. Uh, and before you all clap one more time, there's a reception just uh, once you go out the door. If you turn to your left, there's a uh, Ringel Gallery there. Please uh, continue the conversation with Good. Jean and ask her yeah. questions and help her celebrate in the, at the reception just outside the door. Okay. So, Jean, thanks again. So okay. Much. Thank you.